Namaste. Welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. And we're just about finished with book one. So this time around, I want to read the response of the celestial sages to Rama's talk. And then we're going to analyze a little bit about exactly what Rama had to say. We admire the prince's blessed and grateful speech, dignified with the spirit of detachment that breathes through the whole of it. It is full of thought. It is perspicuous, elegant, clear, dignified, sweet, and worthy of noble-minded men by its lucid style and lack of faults. Who is not struck with admiration at Rama's speech? It expresses his thoughts well, correct in its diction, plain, sweet, and agreeable to all. It is rare to find one man among a hundred who is so eloquent, combining dignity and force with clarity and sweetness, such that they command the admiration of all. Who has such a clear head as our prince, a head that is as penetrating as the best pointed arrow, and as fruitful and beautiful as a creeping vine plant. He is truly a man whose intellectual light, like that of Rama, burns like the flame of a lamp within himself and enlightens all about him. In every forest, trees grow with good flowers and leaves, but the extraordinary and fair clove tree is not always to be found. Rama has displayed the wonder of his knowledge, like the moon displays her cooling beams, and good trees their clusters of blossoms, and like flowers diffuse their fragrance all about. It is very difficult to get the essence of true knowledge in this accursed world, constructed by the uncontrollable and dominant predestination of our past acts. Only those are reckoned the best of men and leaders of the good who try their best to gain the essence of truth and whose minds are fixed on glory as their best treasure. We do not see anyone in all this world equal to Rama in discrimination and magnanimity, nor shall there be one like him in future. This is our firm conviction. So everybody loved Rama's speech, or at least the intelligent and spiritually advanced beings there. They were so struck with what he said that there has to be deep meaning in it. There has to be great significance and value in his words. Otherwise, they would not have been so effusive with their praise. Ordinarily, sages remain silent they don't either give blessings or curses huh? because they know well that both are illusion. But in the case of Rama's speech, he is giving the instructions that lead to liberation. That means permanent release from the round of birth and death, samsara. So in that way, these instructions have absolute value and are the wealth of anyone who wants their real benefit in this world. Now, of course, there are many points that we could talk about in these speeches, but they pretty much speak for themselves. And everything discussed in this whole first book will be elaborated and discussed in great detail in the later books. So, I don't think there's much value in going so deep into what has been expressed. But what has been implied, <laughs> that's another story, and that is worth taking a look at. For example, let's take a look at the themes of Rama's monologue, derived from the chapter titles and the subject of his talk. There is wealth, the human condition, selfish ego, the uncontrollable mind, 
limitless greed, the fragile body, childhood, youth and adolescence and their problems, and of course, the difficulties with the opposite sex. Then there's old age, the influence of time, the influence of change, the inevitability of death, the inevitability of destiny, worldly vanity, worldly mutability, worldly unreliability, and finally, the unreliability of one's own self. <laughs> now, if there's any major problem of human life that's left out of this list, I can't think of what it is, can you? <laughs> so why would Rama investigate or describe so many areas of human life? Why wouldn't he just talk about his particular problems? Huh? Why does he bring up these general uh, problems that affect everyone? Well, as an astrologer, I look at a lot of people's charts. And what I have to see in everyone's chart is called their ruin. Everyone, I don't care how rich, famous, beautiful, talented, smart, or whatever they are, has something that ruins their life. And in astrology, it's commonly connected with the position of Saturn in the chart, the Shani, huh? the, the grandfather, Upas Guru, the disciplinarian, that he acts to uh, give us like a weak spot, a vulnerability. And of course, sooner or later, life is going to get around to stomping on that weak spot. <laughs> and we're going to feel like, oh, my life is ruined. I'm finished. This is it. I can't go on. So this is a problem for everybody, but it's not the same for everyone. Saturn can appear in any one of the 12 signs, in any one of the 12 houses. And so that particular area will be the one that is a problem for that individual. So Rama, because he's not speaking just for himself. First of all, he's a great Vedic king. And in those days, kings had real character not like today's leaders, just out for themselves. But in those days, the kings really kept in their hearts the welfare and benefit of the people. So he's speaking for all the people under his responsibility. He was the prince regent, and he was due to be coronated as the king. So no doubt these responsibilities were weighing heavily on his mind. And more than that, what we know about Rama, that at this point in the story, he doesn't even know about himself, <laughs> is that he's a divine incarnation. He's an avatar. An avatar means that God, Brahman, manifests in a form. And usually these forms have extraordinary qualities, strength, character, wisdom, and so on. So Rama is one of the most famous avatars. And therefore, he is actually already enlightened. But because of a curse, which is described later on in the book, Rama is unaware of who he really is and what he really is. He has only the ordinary intelligence of a human being at this point. Therefore, he sees penetratingly all the different problems, all the whole range of difficulties that can affect a human life. And out of compassion, he wants to address them all. Because every one of these things he has mentioned is somebody's ruin. Every one of these has the potential to ruin somebody's life. 
And until our ruin is handled adequately, we are always vulnerable to having our life basically destroyed. So I know this from firsthand experience. <laughs> in my chart, Saturn is in the fifth house, the house of partnerships and relationships. In Cancer, which is the most emotionally sensitive sign. And he's with Pluto and both are retrograde. Ouch. So that makes it very tough for me to be in relationships, in partnerships, and what to speak of in groups. Huh? Any kind of politics always goes against me from the beginning of my life in my own family. So why should I, for example, keep banging my head against this obstacle when I know how it's going to turn out? I mean, after 70 years now, I know pretty much how things are going to turn out. <laughs> so instead, once we understand what our ruin is, once we see the pattern that keeps repeating over and over again and ruining our life, then we have to look into it and see what is the message here? Because you cannot undo, you cannot uh, get rid of your ruin. It was born along with you and it's going to happen to you. It's your karma for this whole life. But what you can do is transcend it. So in my case, okay, if relationships and partnerships and groups and politics don't work out, just transcend them. Don't get involved. Don't get attached. Be self-reliant. Be independent. Become a recluse, a hermit. Huh? It's not that I don't ever see people, <laughs> of course, and I have some good friends too that I've had for a long time. But that means I don't depend on anybody. I don't think, oh, this person's going to make me happy. Because I know from my experience that relationship could crash any minute. I don't put any stock. I don't put any reliance or trust in my relationships. Because I know from experience, similarly, whatever part of life in, in your life, is your ruin. Whatever it is that comes up again and again and again and destroys your happiness, that is your lesson. And you have to learn to transcend it. That's the message here. So really, Rama is speaking for all human beings. And he's really asking Vasishta, what is the remedy for all human suffering, not just mine or his or yours, huh? but everyone's? This is the magnanimity and the great heartedness of Rama. So now Vasishta is going to reply in book two through book five, and he's going to give the answers to all of Rama's questions systematically. And he's going to touch on all the different problems of life and the ruins and how to avoid them. And that advice, even though it occupies like 1800 pages, <laughs> 21,000 shlokas, uh, uh, We'll get into the architecture and the structure of Yoga Vasishta in the second book, chapter 17. But right now you can know this book one is only 5%. Huh? And we kind of uh, skipped through it very quickly. And uh, we will also, in the future sections, we'll be skipping um, long narrations and stories and stuff like that and focusing on the shlokas that have philosophical or spiritual significance. And then uh, since you can download the, the book and read it on your own, 
you can fill in the context for yourself, right? You did download that, didn't you? <laughs> and read it? I hope so, because that will give you a better understanding of all these issues that we're talking about here. So Yoga Vasishta is really meant for everyone, but it has particular relevance for those who are living their last lifetime in this world. Those who want to attain liberation, moksha, uh, or mukti. So the instructions given, uh, if you follow them, if you take them to heart and make them your own and live them, you will find that they will remove all these sources of suffering. And actually, all these instructions can be summed up very simply in become desireless and become egoless. If you do this, if you psychologically work on yourself using techniques of meditation and austerity, you can remove these things from your character. And we've also discussed many techniques huh? and many philosophical understandings, such as the Buddha's analysis of how ego is created, the mula pariyaya, the root sequence, and so many things that you'll find in Yoga Vasishta are already topics that we have brought up in previous series. The nice thing about Yoga Vasishta is he ties everything together with a sweet, narrative and an engaging story that keeps the reader interested, that, that keeps you wanting to turn those pages and find out what happens next. <laughs> so uh, this is called the Puranic style because the literature known as Puranas, meaning histories, are using the same technique of mixing philosophical wisdom in with an interesting story. And of course, the greatest classic of all is Mahabharata. Uh, so in this way, the Puranas, and we have to class this Maharamayana in with the Puranas, along with the original Ramayana, that uh, aim to educate the masses in spiritual wisdom by giving them a nice story to read, one that they will want to pass on to future generations for its value in overcoming the problems of life. So that's it for book one. Unless I wake up in the middle of the night with some interesting realization, <laughs> I'm going to take a few days off and then we'll start book two. Om Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung. Karunar Navamai Karudakadinal Gum Aruna Chalashivam Yida